Amen. Let's give the Lord a hand clap praise. Man, it is a great delight to be here at Compass Church Naples. Um, this is my first time in Naples, here with my wife, Angelica, who's right here uh, to, to, to your left, my right, um, here with my daughter, uh, Junia, who's two years old. Please pray for her. Um, she's getting used to being in the nursery. She, uh, she's a trip. God, God, God is uh, doing a work in her life. Um, well, as Pastor John said, uh, I'm a church planter in West Palm Beach, Florida. Um, we are launching our church on September 24th. The name of the church is called The Light. Uh, and as I was uh, reading on your bio, I saw that this church um, is about four years old. So you understand what it's like to to plant the church. And I, I just want to let you know that um, I, I'd like you to see us as your co-laborers in bringing the gospel um, to, to Florida. And uh, before I actually get started, can we give a hand clap to Pastor John um, and, and his wife, Jessica? Can we... I just want to honor Pastor John. I met Pastor John at a conference, um, and we got to know one another, and I'm so grateful for this invitation. I also want to uh, say praise God for Chris and his wife, Stephanie, I believe. Yes. Can we, can we give a hand clap? For that? So, I'm a product of the Latino church, and we start our sermons just honoring a whole bunch of people. It takes like an hour. I won't, I won't take an hour today. I just wanted to do that today. Well, I'm going to ask you to turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 10. If you're not used to being in a church setting, um, Matthew is the first book in what is called the New Testament. And today I'd like to talk about God, or when a city recognizes the kingdom of God, when a city recognizes the kingdom of God. And as we read this text and as, we, as I preach through this text, I'm also going to tell you a little bit more about our church planting journey, John chapter 10. John chapter 10 verses 1 uh, through 15 is what we're going to be reading. When you got it, say, I got it. Or you could say, Amen. <laughs> God's word for us today. Matthew chapter 10, verses 1 through 15. The Holy Spirit says this. And he, that's Jesus, called to him his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every disease and every affliction. The names of the 12 apostles are these. First, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, Philip, and Bartholomew, Thomas, and Matthew, the tax collector, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, Simon, the zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. These are 12. These 12 Jesus sent out. Could you say sent out? He sent them out, instructing them, go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no towns of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel and proclaim as you go, saying, the kingdom of heaven. Can you say the kingdom of heaven, kingdom of heaven. is at hand? Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse leopards, cleanse, cast out demons. You received without paying, give without pay, acquire no gold or silver or copper, for your belts, no bag for your journey, or two tunics, or sandals, or a staff, for the laborer deserves his food, verse 11, in whatever town or village you enter, find out who is worthy in it, and stay there until you depart. As you enter the house, greet it. If the house is worthy, let your peace, can you say peace? Come upon it. But if it is not worthy, let your peace, can you say peace? peace? Return to you. And if anyone will not receive you or listen to your words, shake off the dust from your feet when you leave that house or town. 
Last verse, truly I say to you, it will be more bearable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah than for that town. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your word. Your word is a light unto our feet. Your word convicts us. It's powerful. It transforms us. And everybody here today, Lord, I believe you brought them with a purpose to hear this text. So I pray, Lord, that you would soften our hearts, that we would receive your word with great delight, and you would empower us to do your will in your way and in your timing. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. A few years ago... I was a pastor in the city of Chicago on the northwest side of Chicago. It was a church called the Brook Evangelical Free Church. It was actually a church plan. I was part of what is called a core team, um, the team that helped get things going. And I was pretty comfortable. I was working for a nonprofit. Um, I was actually thinking about starting a business. I had dreams of making a lot of money. This was my idea, make a lot of money and give it to the kingdom and keep some of it and get a nice house. And then a year into that church plant, the, the pastor, he comes up to me and he's like, hey man, you have a pastoral call on your life whether you want it or not. You might as well just start assuming it. And my first thought was, oh man, I'm going to be broke. Um, I just never really equated uh, my, my life or in, in my mind uh, being a pastor and um, after some time I ended up becoming a pastoral resident pastoring at that church and as I was pastoring I was comfortable and I said man I'm finally owning this pastoral thing and then the idea of church planting once again came into my heart and the Lord impressed upon my heart to plant the church on the south end of West Palm Beach. Um, there were two things that stood out to me about the city of West Palm Beach. And actually, before I say those things, I actually grew up in that area. Um, I, was, I didn't want to go back to this area. But uh, two things stood out to me. One day I was at a Starbucks, and, and I read this article from Barna Research. And, and it said that West Palm Beach was the number one never church city at that time. And the way that Barna described West Palm Beach as the number one never church city, um, what they meant was that it had the most amount of people per capita that had never regularly, regularly attended a church service in their lives. Secondly, during one of our vision trips um, to West Palm Beach, visiting family, I took a jog one early morning. And on the picture you'll see a laundromat that I passed by. And passed by this, as I passed by this laundromat, I noticed a group of women. They were waiting to, to, to the, for the laundromat to open. And as they were waiting, this is about 5.30 a.m. on a Sunday, the Lord's Day, this thought came into my head and it said, what would it look like for the gospel to saturate neighborhoods like the south side of West Palm Beach? in places like the laundromat. What would that look like? Could these ladies and the families that they represent, could they meet Jesus like the Samaritan woman in John chapter 4? In the everyday mundane things, places of life. And as we began to pray, my wife and I, and we really sensed the Lord leading us there, we began to do a little bit of research on this particular part of the city called the Latin Quarter. Many, many people call it the Latin Quarter. It's the 33405 zip code. And on the screen, you'll see kind of our target area. It covers about four different neighborhoods. That's the way, at least the way Google and the city of West Palm Beach see the Latin Quarter. But, it, but if you were to go there in the neighborhood, nobody really knows the name of their neighborhood. They just kind of know this is where all the Latinos lived. But just to give you a little picture of what this community looks like, about 20,000 people, according to the census, but probably more people, 
um, because there's a lot of people who've arrived there um, just migrating from places like Cuba and Guatemala, from other parts of Central America. Also, about 18% of the people live below the poverty line, and 53% speak Spanish at home. In other words, this is a beautiful community, rich in culture, kind of hard-nosed, ready to, 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 to face life with all that they have and make something out of nothing. There are many looking to survive in the U.S. and settle here in this country. And as I thought about my own story, I have family members who were undocumented, Mother was from Ecuador, dad is from El Salvador, growing up second generation Hispanic. I, I thought about my story and I said, you know, I, 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 I always heard the gospel growing up, but I didn't necessarily see how the gospel applied to my culture, to the way that I grew up, to the, to the different um, aspects of who I am as a Latino be applied. I never, never really saw that. And as God began to burden us, my wife and I, we began to send, sense that God was sending us to this community. And as we talk about sending, I think about this text. Jesus, he's sending his disciples. Jesus had been preaching throughout the area of Galilee up until this point. In chapter 9, at the end of chapter 9, Jesus, one day, he has a busy ministry life. Jesus, he looks into the crowds and he sees that they're distressed and helpless. The text says, and then he looks at his disciples and he says, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out more laborers. And then chapter 10 comes in. And Jesus sends them. In other words, the text that we're about to dive into is an answer to that prayer. In other words, Jesus is implying, disciples, you're an answer to that prayer. Brothers and sisters, we are an answer to that prayer. God has called each and every one of us. It doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter if you're just starting high school. It doesn't matter if you're an empty nester and you just moved to Naples and you want to retire. God has sent you to wherever he has you to be on mission. And in this text, God wants cities, towns to recognize who he is. So what does it look like when a city recognizes Jesus? Point number one, God's kingdom is recognized through the people of Jesus. I don't have time to read verses 2 through 4 and di do a deep dive into that, but, but, but look at verse 1 with me. It says, Jesus gave the 12 disciples or apostles. Apostles is another word for sent agents or commission agents. And it says he gave them authority over unclean spirits to drive them out and to heal every disease and sickness. The word authority here implies that one is empowered with God's authority to do God's kingdom work. And then the text in verses 2 through 4, we see that, that, that the 12 apostles are named. This was interesting about the 12 the, the, the disciples or apostles. The first thing is that they were very ordinary people. Very ordinary people. They were fishermen. Half of them were fishermen. Fishermen were your blue-collar worker in the Roman Empire. Secondly, Jesus selected men or young men with inadequate wisdom and life experience. Scholars mention that many of the disciples were probably youth or at very best young adults. The reason why they say this is is because if you were under a rabbi, you were typically about ages 15 or, or 13 to about age 30. So that's why they say th these were probably youth. Th these, these were kids, essentially, that didn't have life experience. And lastly, Jesus chose leaders from the least influential place in that region. 
most of these disciples were from a region called Galilee. Galilee was a place in the Roman Empire that was known for its protest against the kingdom. It's on the outskirts of the city center. And this is where Jesus chooses his leaders. And as I think about my own story, as I think about our core team, this has been our story. I just said that the south side of the city is uh, low income place that's impoverished. And I'd be lying if I said when I was first trying to come in church plan, I was trying to pick the best of the best. I wanted the staff. I wanted, you know. I'd never say that, but in my heart I really knew. And I was tempted as I'm trying to recruit to think that I could do God's job in protect, uh, selecting who would be part of our core team. And I remember there was a, a friend of mine that he just encouraged me, and he said, hey, if you're going to plant the church for this community, it'd probably be a good idea that you try to evangelize and recruit some people from this community. And I'm just looking around, I'm like, man, okay, this is going to be really difficult. I mean, people are pretty guarded here, my wife knows, um, and I don't think any place in the United States right now is looking for the next best church. My community, probably even more, a little skeptical of, of Christianity. They think a lot of pastors come and exploit. They live in a, a, a penthouse suite while everybody else is impoverished. And little by little, and there's a picture there of our core team, God began to bring different people onto our core team. And the ironic thing about all of this is that I didn't go out of my way to recruit any of them. As we got on the ground, actually, our core team, the core team that we thought we would have, actually bailed completely, except for one person. So here we are. My wife was pregnant at the time. It's just me and her. We're feeling like Joseph and Mary, traversing the airs and the land of the Midwest into the south end of West Palm Beach, feeling lonely. Throughout that first year, God begins to bring people from the community, people passionate about this vision and what this reminds me of and what this text reminds me of is that Jesus doesn't pick people at his service like the world does. See, the world, they pick people based off your merits, what you've earned, your eloquence, your educational pedigree. That's not the way that Jesus handpicks people. Jesus picks ordinary, sometimes even marginalized people to do his work to make his kingdom recognizable. And maybe you're here today, you're like, well, I do have some educational degrees. Praise God. God wants to use those things too. My point is that he doesn't need to use those things. But he delights to do it. So how does God make his kingdom recognizable in a city like Naples, in a city like West Palm Beach? It's through the people of God, the church. God uses people. Now that we understand that God uses people, well, the question is, what does he call people to do? Secondly, God's kingdom is recognized through the proclamation of Jesus. The proclamation of Jesus. In verse 7, if you just read it with me one more time, it says this. It says, proclaim as you go, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Why does Jesus say, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Why doesn't Jesus say, hey, tell them the Messiah is here? If you just read through the, through the Bible, throughout the New Testament, you would see that Jesus, he often preached the gospel that was about the kingdom of God. So what does that mean? In the Old Testament, the Jewish prophets predicted that one day God would establish his everlasting kingdom on earth. It would be 
a kingdom free of disease, death, and sin. See, the prophet Daniel in chapter 2, verse 44, he prophesies about this. And here Jesus is saying, the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God is at hand or what others, uh, other translations say, the kingdom of God is near. Another way where Jesus is saying, this is what you need to tell others. And he says, I'm giving you power to give people a foretaste of that kingdom. What was that power? Look at verse 7 with me one more time. He says, heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse lepers, cast out demons. You received without paying, give without pay." So here Jesus is saying, when you go to these towns, declare that the kingdom of God is at hand, that kingdom where it will be free of disease and sin and all kinds of brokenness. And here, I'm going to give you some power. And after I give you this power, it's supposed to be a sign of that kingdom. You ever been to Costco? Sometimes I just go to Costco for this one thing. It's just the samples. <laughs> Don't act like you never did that. You go on a Costco, you walk through an aisle, and here are these people, the employees, they have these sort of carts, and they have samples of a product. That sample is meant to be a foretaste of their product. At this time, in this text, it was similar. See, when the apostles were to, to do these, these miracles and signs, they were to be a sample of the end product of the kingdom. So that when people saw them do these miracles and signs, they would say, surely what they are saying is true. What does that mean for us? See, Jesus Christ, he is the center of God the Father's kingdom. Jesus Christ, he did miracles. He taught with authority, the text shows us. But the greatest miracle that he ever did was that he lived the perfect life that you and I could not live. He died the death that we deserve. And here's the miracle, past miracle. Third miracle in this is that after three days, we sung about it, he resurrected from the dead. And when he resurrected from the dead, he gave people like you and me, broken, sinful people that have rebelled against God. He gave us the opportunity to have a relationship with God and have a place in God's kingdom. See, Jesus' resurrection was a foretaste of our resurrection in God's kingdom. See, Jesus is coming back. And Jesus, he's going to restore this world. Heaven will come on earth. He'll restore places like the south end of West Palm Beach. He'll restore places like Naples. He'll reign in every person that believes in Jesus will be under his authority co-heirs with Jesus, inheriting this kingdom. But as we do this, what's supposed to happen? So we know that God's kingdom is recognizable through the people of God, the church. We also know that God's kingdom is recognizable when we proclaim the gospel of the kingdom which is centered on Jesus, You're supposed to proclaim that, tell others about that. But what's supposed to happen when we get to our cities or our places, our jobs, what, what's supposed to happen as we proclaim God's kingdom is recognized through the peace of Jesus. Peace is supposed to happen. In this text, Jesus is sending apostles on a brief mission. And he wanted on this brief mission to rely completely on him. He says, don't take any extra stuff. Just rely on me. 
through my divine provision given through you, your hearers. As a matter of fact, he tells them, don't even take any kind of money in verses 9 and 10. Don't take any extra clothes or staff. Staff was this sort of stick that they would use for self-defense to help them walk through the hard terrain. What he's telling them is, rely on me for provision and protection. By the way, this is not in my notes. Side note, whenever God sends us on mission, we're supposed to do the same. Rely on his provision and his protection. I, I remember a family member telling, my, uh, telling me in front of my wife, hey, why would, why would you bring your family into a place that we try to get you out of? We, we don't want you to live in those kinds of places no more. So we work hard to get out of. What if something happens to you? And my wife just looks at my family member in the face and he says, it's better to do God's will than to be safe as the world measures safety. And if they kill my husband, he's better in God's hands. We're supposed to rely on God for our provision and our protection. This is what Jesus is sending his disciples to do. And he says in verse 12, greet a household when you enter it. And if the household is worthy, let your peace be on it in verse 12. Why do they say that? The formal greeting of a Jewish person was shalom or peace. To greet someone with shalom at that time was a sort of wish prayer for that household. The word shalom meant that, 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 that the person coming in was, was pronouncing God's highest good, wholeness, to that household. So when the apostles were to be received with hospitality, they were to pronounce God's highest good on those households. Their highest good for their personal lives, for their family life, for that society. Sort of to be a foretaste of God's kingdom. That was, that was the prayer greeting that they were supposed to give when they were received. So what does that tell us? Is that whenever we go out and we proclaim to others the good news of Jesus Christ and that the kingdom of God is near, when people receive that message or they're willing to listen to our message, we're supposed to pronounce or pray for peace over their lives. But not any old kind of peace. The kind of peace that reflects God's kingdom. There's a lot of broken families in our cities. A lot of divorce happening in our cities. A, a lot of retirees in Naples and in West Palm Beach that feel like they have nothing to live for no more. When you take the good news to them, pray for peace. But what happens if they don't receive us? Verse 14, it says, if anyone does not welcome you or listen to your words, leave that house or town. Truly, I tell you, it will be more tolerable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah than for that town. The phrase, shake the dust off your feet, you see it in the text? It was a figure of speech that meant that Jesus would judge them with his wrath eventually if they rejected the good news of Jesus. Jesus even depicts these wicked cities, Sodom and Gomorrah, who rejected God. And he says it would be worse for the people who reject the kingdom of God through Jesus than for those cities. The reality of this is that this judgment is reserved for those that constantly close their ears and their hearts to Jesus. So what that tells us is as we go out, as God sends us, when people reject you, not if people reject you, when people reject you, if you lose your job, 
because you shared the gospel with your coworker. Leave it to God. God will deal with that. So how does a city recognize God's kingdom? It's through the people of Jesus, the proclamation of Jesus, and finally, the peace of Jesus. Now that we know how to make a city like Naples recognize the kingdom of God, the question is, what difference does that make? As we do this, as the people proclaim and pray for peace, what difference does that make in our lives? As I thought about this, I thought about a light bulb. I wish I had a light bulb with me right now. What I love about a light bulb is that a light bulb is very small. But the purpose of a light bulb is to brighten up dark places. It's small with one purpose. But the beautiful thing about a light bulb is you can find a light bulb anywhere. You can find a light bulb in a room like this. You can find a light bulb in an uh, alley with light with a, being lit. You can find a light bulb in a high building. You can see a light bulb anywhere that you go. One purpose, different places. And as I thought about our mission and our purpose to to preach the gospel and pray for peace as Jesus sends us out, as we live out that purpose, we're meant to live out that purpose like a light bulb. Any and everywhere. At your job. At your school. On your block. In your gated community. You're meant to be like the light bulb. You're meant to live out that purpose, to proclaim and pray for peace. How beautiful would it be to see the light bulbs of Jesus, Compass Church, shine in the public school system, in business, in parent associations for schools, and in, in, in HOAs, how cool would it be to see the light bulbs of Jesus in those places? That's where Jesus wants to shine. As I thought about this, I thought about Beverly, this young girl, she's 17 years old. Um, I met her at, at a local high school. Our local high school is called Forest Hill High School. And... Uh, I ran away from youth ministry. I'm not the youth ministry guy. I love youth, just not youth ministry. It wasn't my thing. Um, but one of the things that I quickly noticed in our communities, there's a lot of youth. A lot of youth going 15 to 22 years old, quickly, growing up fast. And I just had an opportunity to begin to serve with a campus ministry there. This is a public high school. I meet this young girl in Beverly, she had just came to faith through one of her teachers in the public school. And I ran into her after that club. I ran into her um, at, a, a, on, at, a, at, a, at another um, event. And she was like, hey, you're the pastor guy. I, I just saw a Facebook ad with you. I, I feel like I see you popping up everywhere. We were running a Facebook ad to an interest meeting that nobody showed up to anyways. But she was like, hey, I recognize your face. You're that pastor guy. And I was like, yeah, I guess so. Yeah, you want to come to our, our Bible study? She's like, yeah, I'll be there with my mom. She ends up coming to our Bible study. My wife begins to disciple her every Monday at the local uh, Starbucks and McDonald's, Starbucks is a little expensive for us sometimes. And then a few months ago, she says, Pastor Jeremy, I need to get baptized. And I'm like, oh, man, we haven't launched yet. How are we going to do this baptism thing? Like, like our core team is, is only 12 people. Um, and, 
you know, some of them are unchurched. Like, I don't, I don't know if we could do this. And I kept telling my wife, yeah, I don't, I don't think it's time. I think we need to wait till lunch. And my wife was like, no, nah, I think we need to baptize her. We need to make that happen. How, how many men here know that sometimes the voice of the Holy Spirit comes through our wives? Right? So my wife is telling me this, and, and I, I've been married a few years now. I kind of know, okay, God, you're speaking to me. Let's just do this baptism. Well, this young lady, she ends up bringing about 50 people to her baptism ceremony. Ends up being a pre-launch or a, a, yeah, pre-launch service, a preview service. People from the community. And she begins to testify about how Jesus changed her life. How she lived a tumultuous life, an enemy to God, yet she believed in Jesus. She says, I said yes to Jesus. He has changed my life and now I want to change the world for Jesus. It's a young girl from the barrio, all, stack, all odds stacked against her. Yet Jesus, using his plan to put me in that public school that at first I didn't even want to be in, to shine the light reluctantly. So this is all God's doing. He, he uses that. Connects this teacher who's being a light bulb in the public schools prior to me even showing up. And then my wife discipling her. Baptizing her. Three different people. Three different light bulbs. In different places. One purpose. To make Jesus known. Pray for peace for her family. And now she's part of our church family as well, our core team, doing the same for others. Listen to me, she doesn't even come to church with her other family or her, her parents. She oftentimes comes alone with her siblings, inviting her other friends. I often joke around with her and I say, hey, Beverly, you're the one planting this church. I'm just here facilitating things. It's inspired me and changed my life, changed our lives, my wife, my wife and I's life. So the question on the floor today is, will you be a light bulb? Will you make the kingdom of God recognizable where God has you? That is God's word for us today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your word. I pray that you would make us into light bulbs that shine brightly. If there's anybody here who doesn't know who Jesus is, I pray that they would come into a relationship with Jesus by believing that Jesus died and resurrected from the grave. I pray for those of us who have had a dim light, been afraid maybe apathetic toward your kingdom purposes, I pray you would do a work in our lives that we would repent of our sin and turn to you. I pray all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen.